Hey, this is Brandon Vietti, one of the producers of Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Batgirl B one six. Recognized Spoiler B two eight. Hello, team. Welcome to the Watchtower, and welcome also to season two of Secret Origins. In this series, I'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, the heroes, the supporting cast and even the villains. Today, we'll be discussing fan-favorite Batfam member, Batgirl, in as many of her iterations as I can manage <laughs> in one podcast. Before we get started, I wanted to send out an overdue thank you to our newest Patreon member, Peter Van Batavia. Thank you so much to Peter and to all of our Patreon backers. We've been thanking backers and reading reviews on our Intel updates up to now, but since Season 3 is almost here, we'll be rearranging our formats a bit to accommodate, so more on that soon. And a special thank you to the editor for this episode, Kyle Gould. Kyle is the husband of Discussion Session guest MC Gould and is the host of the wonderful Tavern Tales podcast. I especially recommend checking out Tavern Tales Jr., where Kyle runs sessions for a variety of kids ages 5 and up, and you can find them at www.taverntales.ca. Kyle volunteered to help us because November is convention month in the role-playing game industry, and both of our normal editors, Neil and Richard, are attending Metatopia in Morristown, New Jersey, and Akatacon in Dayton, Ohio. Both are brilliant conventions, and if you are in the area and are interested in role-playing games, we highly recommend you check them out. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, though most people know Barbara Gordon as the quote-unquote first Batgirl, the actual first appearance of Batgirl is a character named Betty Kane. Betty Kane first appeared in Batman issue number 139 in April of 1961 and was created by Bill Finger and Sheldon Moldoff. The first appearance of Barbara Gordon in the comics, I will have to say, clarify, is Detective Comics number 359 in January of 1967. She was created by William Dozer, Julius Schwartz, a.k.a. Julie Schwartz, and Carmine Infantino, and that first issue was written by Gardner Fox. The character was actually created in answer to the success of the 1966 Batman TV series, so we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. There are three other people who have appeared as Batgirl in the past. The first one we're not going to talk too much about, it's Helena Bertinelli. Helena Bertinelli, as some of you will know, is known as the Huntress, and she appeared briefly as Batgirl in the No Man's Land event. We'll leave Helena Bertinelli to the side and see if she shows up in, in John Justice at some point. But in that same event, Cassandra Kane became Batgirl. Cassandra Kane's first appearance was in Batman 567 in July of 1999, at least the character of Cassandra Kane, and then appeared as Batgirl for the first time in Legends of the Dark Knight number 120. And she was created by Kelly Puckett and Damian Scott. And then the first appearance of Stephanie Brown was, as the spoiler, in Detective Comics 647 and 648 of June and July of 1992. Her first appearance as Robin was in Robin issue number 126 in May of 2004. And as Batgirl in Batgirl number 1, August of 2009. And she was created by Chuck Dixon and Tom Lyle. So let's talk about... We've got a lot to talk about uh, with all of these incredible characters. The first one let's talk about is let's briefly talk about Betty or Bet Kane. And normally, uh, I would I don't really think about her very much. The original Betty Kane appeared in just a handful of episodes back in the 1960s, 50s. But the thing is, Bet Kane appears not only in Young Justice, but was returned to continuity and uh, is an established Titans character. So let's talk about that for a bit. So the original Batgirl said that way because there's a hyphen in between for, I have, I have no idea why, was the niece of and sidekick to the Kathy Kane, the original Batwoman, as well as created to be a love interest for Dick Grayson. In 1964, DC took a fundamental kind of concept change in the response to declining Batman sales and brought Batman back to his roots 
in vigilantism. However, in the 70s, both characters were brought back into continuity and Batgirl became a member of the Titans West. In Crisis on Infinite Earths in the 80s, Betty Kane was retconned out of existence. However, the character of Mary Elizabeth Bet Kane was introduced in Secret Origins Annual Number 3 in 1989, several years after, as the character of Flamebird. As you've heard me talk about on several episodes of the reviews and the actual play podcast we did, Dick Grayson took the name Nightwing after being inspired by Superman stories of a mythic Kryptonian duo named Nightwing and Flamebird. In the current continuity, Bet Kane is the cousin of the current Batwoman, Kate Kane, and has worked as her sidekick as well. Now let's move into Barbara Gordon. I love Barbara Gordon, and we're going to get into that. The character of Batgirl had been gone from the Batman comics for several years when DC was approached by the producers of the Batman 66 TV show and asked them if they would create a female character to add to the Bat family, uh, at least in the comics, as well as with the TV show. The character appeared in the third season of the Batman 66 TV series, played by the amazing Yvonne Craig. And in the comics, she appeared simultaneously with her appearance in the TV show. She was created as the daughter of Commissioner Jim Gordon and the sister to Jim Gordon Jr. Barbara owned the role of Batgirl in comics until the Batgirl special number one in January of 1988 where she retired, in the comics anyway, from crime fighting. Just two months later, after this retirement, she appeared again in the dark and controversial The Killing Joke. There, Barbara was shot by the Joker, who paralyzed her from the waist down. Almost one year later, in January of 1989, Barbara appeared in Suicide Squad number 23, still paralyzed as the brilliant computer expert and information broker Oracle created by Kim Yale and John Ostrander. The character continued to appear in other media like Batman the Animated Series as Batgirl. Her origin story involved her attending a costume ball dressed in kind of a somewhat gender-swapped Batman costume when the villain Killer Moth attempted to kidnap Bruce and she intervened. Later interpretations have her as the niece slash adopted daughter of Jim Gordon and having been saved by Batman as a girl and then becoming inspired by him and trained to become like him, etc. Barbara Gordon as both Batgirl and especially as Oracle has been the center of numerous debates and academic papers regarding the representation and treatment of women and people with disabilities in comics and in popular media. Her paralysis at the hands of the Joker was pretty shocking for me. I was 18 at the time, as it was meant to be. Her reinvention as Oracle blew my mind, and she became one of my favorite characters in the DC universe for a number of reasons. Barbara had always to me been much more than a shadow of the bat, and with Oracle for the first time she was able to shine as the brilliant intellect and crime fighter I always wanted her to be. There are far too few original female heroes in DC that aren't a reflection of a male counterpart. Oracle began appearing in other titles as a superhero information and logistics support system. She was the woman behind not just Batman, but the entire DC universe. And for me, and for a number of other fans, her origin story had gone from shocking in 1988 to troublesome. In 2011, during the New 52 and continuing to rebirth, Barbara reclaimed the mantle of Batgirl sans her disability, a choice that sparked a renewal of debate and discussion, which we'll get into in a little bit as well. In the new continuity, Barbara had been paralyzed by the Joker and spent several years as Oracle, but went through cutting-edge treatment to regain her mobility. She continues to go through psychological treatment for PTSD related to the incident, a topic that we touched on a bit in our discussion session with Dr. Drea Letamendi, who is canonically Barbara Gordon's therapist. Now we get into Cassandra Kane. Cassandra Kane is a Batgirl that not many people know. Cassandra Kane is the daughter of League of Assassins trainer David Kane and martial arts master of the DC Universe, Lady Shiva. Cassandra was raised by her father to become a perfect assassin. Unlike Damian Wayne, Cass was severely abused and isolated by her father. She was never taught to read or write and was prevented from speaking. The only language that she was allowed to communicate in was human body language. Her first and presumably only assassination was at the age of eight years old. But when the man died... She was able to read and process his body language and take on his pain and his horror, and at that point, ran from her father. Cass's ability to read intentions through movement 
as well as her ability to process her own body movements and physical and mental abilities, makes her one of the most effective combatants in the DC universe. In fact, she is one of the only characters to have ever bested her mother, Lady Shiva, in combat. Her ability to communicate was eventually put back online by a psychic who reprogrammed the language centers of her brain. Unfortunately, that reprogramming prevented her from doing the body language reading that she had done previously, and so at a later point in time had to approach her mother, Lady Shiva, who apparently also has this uh, knack to retrain her brain. Though Cass is one of the least known bad girls, she has a few distinctions. One of the distinctions is that of being the first bad girl to star in an eponymous specific bat girl series as the ward of Barbara Gordon herself. Cass eventually hands the mantle of bat girl over to Stephanie Brown, taking on her own persona as the black bat, and then followed currently, as I understand it, the hero known as Orphan. And that brings us to Stephanie Brown. The last character to wear the mantle of Batgirl besides Barbara Gordon was the hero formerly known as Spoiler, and also as Robin, <laughs> Stephanie Brown. Stephanie is the daughter of the C-string villain Clue Master, who had been out of Stephanie's life during his time in prison. He returned to civilian life, claiming to have been rehabilitated, but when Stephanie discovered that he'd returned to his life of crime, but this time... <laughs> I have to say a little smarter, without the compulsion to leave clues to what his upcoming crimes were going to be, she took on the persona of spoiler and began leaving clues herself for authorities and mass crime fighters as to her father's upcoming crimes. Spoiler had a recurring role in the first Robin solo series starring the Tim Drake Robin. Stephanie's role in the Robin series, as well as Batman specials and her own two-year run as Batgirl 2009 to 20 2011, have garnered accolades and critique. Wizard Magazine rated Robin the best ongoing series in 1998 due largely to a storyline in which Tim helped Stephanie through a pregnancy and supporting her as she put the child up for adoption. Her run as Batgirl is highly regarded as one of the best Batgirl arcs in the character's history. In 2004, after years of appearing in Robin, and five years before inheriting the mantle of Batgirl from Cassandra Cain, Stephanie was tortured and killed in Batman War Games. This led to some unfortunate choices in the next few years, though Jason Todd was memorialized in the Batcave by Batman and is regularly referred to before his Red Hood reappearance um, as a motivating factor or key foothold for Bruce's personality ongoing after his death, Stephanie had no memorial and wasn't memorialized for quite a long time after. This situation was retconned later on as Batman stating he always had suspicions about whether or not she'd actually died, so that led him to not choose to put up a memorial. But I don't know, that's pretty heartless, even for the 90s. Bots, Batman. Uh, she had been taken to Dr. Leslie Tompkins, who's a friend and ally to Batman, after she was so brutally tortured by Black Mask, but Leslie told Bruce that she let Stephanie die as a warning to other kids who might follow her lead, which is very weird for Leslie. Very cold. So just before her becoming Batgirl, Stephanie returned to the comics appearing as Spoiler, who Bruce and Tim both thought was somebody else appearing as her until they found out it was actually her. And she revealed to them that Leslie hadn't let her die, which makes some more sense, but had saved her life and put her into hiding. Black Mask had learned her identity, so Leslie wanted her safe, but safe from both Black Mask and apparently from Batman. When Barbara Gordon returned to the role of Batgirl in the New 52 reboot, Stephanie was written out of continuity. Her first appearance later on, thanks to kind of fan outcry, was a spoiler in 2014. That was three years after the New 52's debut. For those who might not know, Stephanie made her animation debut in Young Justice, season two, Before the Dawn as one of the teenagers kidnapped by the Reach, and she, of course, will be appearing in Season 3 as Spoiler, alongside new team members Tracy 13 and Arrowette. So there's your general rundown of all of the characters who have appeared as Batgirl. So let's get into talking about their power sets. 
Uh, might seem a little straightforward, but there is some specialization going on here. In the comics, all of the Batgirls are acrobats, detectives, skilled martial artists, though the level of those skills varies depending on who you're talking about. Barbara Gordon, of course, in addition to having a doctorate and being a brilliant researcher, also possesses a photographic memory and is one of, if not the, premier hackers and computer experts in the DC universe. Even as Oracle, Barbara continued her martial arts training, becoming an expert in Eskrima, which is, uses the same, what are called Eskrima sticks or Joe staffs that Nightwing uses. Uh, and she also happens to be a crack shot, both with thrown objects and, interestingly enough for the Bat family, firearms. Cassandra Kane, of course, was trained in detective work by Tim Drake while she was in her role as Batgirl. But hands down, her prowess with martial arts is her specialty. When she returned to Lady Shiva to ask her to help train her back in her reading of body language, her relationship was really kind of messed up. Lady Shiva said she would do it, but she had to return in a year to fight to the death. I don't understand. They did. Cassandra was beaten at first by Lady Shiva. Lady Shiva uh, returned her to life, I believe, by using a Lazarus pit, if I remember correctly, uh, because she realized that Cassandra was not fighting at her full potential because she had a death wish. They met again. They fought again. And in this case, Cass defeated Lady Shiva and in true comic book fashion appeared to even perhaps kill her though Lady Shiva does return. So her defeat of Lady Shiva in combat technically ranks Cass as the best martial artist in the DC universe. And though Stephanie isn't the best, quote unquote, at any specific bat fam crime fighting skill, she's learned research and detective work from two of DC's best detectives, meaning Barbara and Tim, and martial arts from DC's best martial artist, Cass Kane. That's not nothing. But one thing that Stephanie has <laughs> at a level that's hard to match by any hero short of Wally West is genuine, honest, and deep enthusiasm for being a superhero. And I'm interested to see how she brings that to the team. So in relation to Young Justice, we often, when we're talking about power sets, kind of compare the comics and any changes or differences that might appear in Young Justice. We've only seen Barbara. Uh, so far in the series and her leadership skills, detective work and martial arts training are all pretty easy to see. We don't get a lot of Barbara in season two. I'm hoping now that we know that Oracle is showing up in season three, that we'll get a little bit more of Barbara as um, kind of shining a light on the individual specific and amazing skills that she has. In the tie-in comics, <laughs> I think we, Emily and I mentioned this when we were reviewing the tie-in tie comics. At one point, there's a episode, there's a, excuse me, issues where it's Dick's birthday. I want to say his 14th birthday. And Barbara is invited. At some point, someone says something about Barbara and Dick mentions that Barbara is, oh, her, she's good at everything. Implying that her photographic memory, her intellect, her reflexes are all going to be represented in the show. In fact, Emily had a fascinating theory that is now my headcanon that when it was Barbara's turn to spin the bottle during the party... She knew exactly how and how much force and what direction and what to do to spin that bottle to have it land exactly on Dick so that they can have their moment in the closet. So let's talk about my history with Batgirl a little bit and a lot of people's history with Batgirl a little bit because a lot of it started in Batman 66. Yvonne Craig was my Batgirl. The Batman 66 show was in reruns when I was watching it in you know the mid-70s. But every episode with Batgirl made me really happy. In retrospect, I wanted more from her, though. I loved the idea of Batgirl and didn't quite get what I was hoping for out of her. And I don't think I had the words for it at the time. Yvonne Craig has said in interviews that they wouldn't let her learn or use martial arts for the combat scenes. They choreographed all of her fights around a very stage dance-like style that was impractical at best. In retrospect, I remember like she would be like picked up by Batman and she would do like these pointy-toed high kicks and things that aren't, again, particularly practical. As I mentioned earlier, when Barbara retired and then was shot by the Joker with 
no agency at all, it broke my heart. It was, I, I, I thought, okay, well, it's a one shot. She'll recover. It'll be fine. And then she didn't, she was gone for a year and almost like faded into obscurity at that point, which was unfortunate. But then when Oracle happened, I saw Barbara come into her own. There's been, as I mentioned, a lot, a lot of controversy. And I have to say, I can relate to the decision making process that has got to go behind the character of Oracle and what to do with her from now on. It's got to be a tough decision deciding between either one, having a character with uh, a disability represented with respect in comics, y you want to have that. But two, justifying living in a world where Batman can recover from a broken back by Bane and character after character comes back from the dead. But Barbara is somehow left behind on the healing process. It's, it's, it's kind of a no-win scenario. So, so far, we only have confirmation that Oracle is in season three. We don't even know if technically we'll ever see her in person to confirm whether or not she's paralyzed at all. Part of me wants her to be in her wheelchair in the clock tower. And another part of me wants her to have made the decision to leave the Batgirl persona behind herself and become her own hero without the uncomfortable way that the paralysis happened being a part of the Young Justice continuity. But hopefully we'll get answers to that in just a couple of months. Barbara already being Oracle and Stephanie coming into the series as spoiler also leaves some interesting questions unanswered. Uh, will Cass, as in Cassandra Kane, already be a part of the Young Justice universe in season three as Batgirl? That's a possibility. Um, not only, I mean, technically she was mute. And so she doesn't need to be cast if they keep her that way and they don't do that psychic you know, reprogramming of her brain during the season, she could already be out there. And by the end of the season, if she hands that mantle over to Stephanie, I think that would be fantastic. But not only was Cass the first Batgirl to star in her own series, she's just, she's a fascinating character with a history that is entirely unique to the Bat family. And she brings some, honestly, some much needed diversity to the team. Other questions like, when will Steph become Batgirl? We see her as spoiler, and we know that Oracle is not Batgirl anymore, so there is a gap there. If Cass isn't in, or even if she is in, will Steph become Batgirl during this next season? Will she become? Will she take the step to become Robin first? Will Tim Drake step out and become fully embrace the Red Robin persona? We're getting some hints that he may be Red Robin in this third season. So if that's the case, will they have a relationship? I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, another thing I'd like to see is the birds of prey. So Oracle, the Oracle herself didn't get a necessarily an ongoing series with her name on it. She absolutely had an ongoing series where she was the star. And that's called birds of prey, where early on there was a one shot that Oracle brought together Black Canary and Huntress the character of Helena Bertinelli I mentioned earlier, together and basically became their person in the chair and sent them on missions, which was absolute brilliance. And we've mentioned it on the show a little bit. We also mentioned it a bit in the uh, Jeff Stormer episode where we were talking about Ted Cord because Ted Cord had also worked together with the Birds of Prey. And Barbara and Ted had a um, interesting friendship and relationship. So will Birds of Prey be on the show? I mean, Oracle and Black Canary are already prominent members. So I would love to see a Birds of Prey with maybe Zatanna or Rocket or Artemis, uh, i.e. Tigress, or maybe other members taking the place of the missing Huntress as team members. I mean, I, it's possible Huntress might even be shown in the show. They haven't missed much as far as DC Comics characters are concerned, so I wouldn't be surprised if Huntress at least makes an appearance, even if she's not a main character in the show, or at least gets referenced, would be really cool. But one thing I, I know that I want for Season 3, and that I trust that the team can pull off, is to have all the Batgirls be treated with the level of respect that they deserve. Stephanie and Barbara have both had some ups and downs and questionable events in their history where they were just tools 
to motivate other characters in this show, male characters particularly. And uh, Cass was raised with some pretty uncomfortable abuse as a child. Um, I would like those characters to take some more agency in them being heroes and owning that. Um, how to interpret those things can go in different ways, but I trust this team, this creative team, to be able to give us some, hopefully some pretty great and perhaps original takes on these characters while still keeping the heart of those characters fully intact. Let's get on to a few recommendations for some reading. In addition to the origin issues that I already mentioned above, there are a few great bad girl stories that I'd like to recommend, and you can even just type in stuff like best Stephanie Brown stories or best Oracle stories, best bad girl stories, etc., and find some, some pretty good lists. We've already recommended, if I remember correctly, the Stephanie Brown run of Batgirl from 2009 to 2011. Uh, we, I wouldn't be surprised if we recommended it more than once, but you need to make sure to check those out. We'll have links to the comiXology issues in the show notes below. Uh, you can also keep an eye out if you're already a DC Universe subscriber, if you're here in the United States. Um, you can check it out. I didn't actually take, the look, take a look to see if those were available there, but they're definitely on Comixology. An Oracle issue that I think might be really interesting, or Oracle story that I think might be interesting to some uh, watchers of Young Justice and readers of the Young Justice tie-in comics was called On Wings, and it was Birds of Prey issue number eight. It's early on in the series. It'll give you a bit of a glimpse into the Birds of Prey series, which I highly recommend. But this issue is unique. It's Nightwing reflecting back on a date between himself and Oracle. That's it. There's no supervillains. There's just them. For those fans who didn't see the relationship between Dick and Barbara, a.k.a. known as Maneuver 7, <laughs> coming in the final issue of the tie-in comics, stories like this uh, are probably something that you might uh, be interested in. Even in the clips we've seen so far, we've seen some flirting between Dick and Barbara. So, We'll see how uh, that pans out in the series. And then the last thing for, for Cassandra Kane, there uh, were a few recommendations that I found for some good arcs. I read a few individual issues myself, so I'm going off some recommendations from the net. But one of the things that was recommended was a Batgirl miniseries from 2008. It's a six-issue miniseries that stars uh, Cass, and I will. Uh, we also have the links in the show notes. So that wraps up our first episode of Season 2, Secret Origins. Next time, I'll be discussing one of my favorite titans who has a power that is very close to my heart, and that's Changeling, known to pretty much everyone else in the world as Beast Boy. And we'll get into that next time. Thanks so much for spending some time with me in the Watchtower. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know whether you're inside the U.S. or outside the U.S., but especially if you're outside the U.S. because we have to look a little harder to track those down. And, of course, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about this amazing series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology or binge the YJ Comics on the DC Universe app and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well